Latin American history has been full of trauma, resistance, and a search for the improvement of the lot of people living there. Unfortunately, all too often the region has been fraught with political instability and the inequality that developed as part of the colonization process remains 200 years after most countries gained independence. To see why, join me for this brief explainer on the history and politics of Latin America. The idea of Latin America begins with the arrival of the Europeans to the Americas, Columbus to the Caribbean in 1492 and Alvarez Cabral to Brazil in 1500. Columbus and the Spanish immediately set out to enslave the indigenous population so they could exploit the resources of the new lands and by 1520 they not only controlled most of the Caribbean but the Tainos, Caribs and Arawaks who lived there were already nearly wiped out as ill treatment from the Spanish and European diseases decimated their numbers. The Portuguese on the other hand were more focused on the riches of Africa and the Far East so at first they were less interested in enslaving the indigenous people they had encountered. Still, they found the countries Brazil would useful and when incursions from other Europeans began to threaten what they saw as valuable commercial property, they began to settle it. Initially, these were private enterprises, but because most failed, the crown eventually reorganized them between our northern and southern government, setting up the seeds for both federalism and regional divisions in Brazil today. Unlike the Spanish, however, these Brazilian colonies would always remain centered on the Atlantic. Although the Bandeirantes, Brazilian enslavers and explorers, pushed the authority of the Portuguese westward and ended up adding hundreds of miles to the claims of the Portuguese crown, these were mostly in the 18th century and even then the more important places, like those of the mining towns in Minas Gerais, were only around 300 miles from the coast. By contrast, some of the most important parts of the Spanish Empire lay high in the mountain valleys in Potosí and Mexico City. This was because in the 1520s and 1540s, the Spanish encountered the two most powerful empires in the continent, the Aztecs and the Incas, both of whom had their capitals far from the coast, and Europeans were able to not just conquer them, but place themselves atop an already existing social structure. These conquests came shockingly quick as a result of three important Spanish advantages. The first and most important was division among indigenous societies. The Aztecs had plenty of enemies among those that they forced to pay them tribute, most notably the Tlaxcalans, a critical ally for the Spanish, while the Incas were in the middle of a civil war between two competing claimants to the Inca throne, Huascar and Atahualpa. The second critical advantage were the diseases the Spanish carried, especially measles and smallpox, which the indigenous peoples had no natural immunity for. This decimated the indigenous population, including the Aztec and Inca elite. In fact, the reason why the Incas had a succession crisis in the first place was because Huayna Capac, the previous Inca emperor and his son, had died as a result of contracting either measles or smallpox. The final advantage for the Spanish was their technological edge, especially the horse riding and muskets. This was crucial as it allowed the Spanish to have the ability to communicate accurately and quickly across vast distances and have disproportionate power relative to their numbers. But the Concas would have been much different or even non-existent without the first two advantages, as it indeed was the case with European colonization in Africa and Asia. Both the Spanish and the Portuguese exploited their colonies to benefit the mother country, but while Brazilian wealth was based mostly around agricultural products, such as sugar, and mostly depended on enslaved African labor, the Spanish was based much more around the mining of gold and silver and had far more extensive use of coerced indigenous labor, except in places where the indigenous population had been wiped out or was less prevalent, such as in the Caribbean. For 300 years, the Spanish and Portuguese fought off European competitors, crushed resistance from the indigenous enslaved population, and maintained a close hierarchical society. And just as their colonization process had begun around the same time, so would they meet a parallel end and for the same underlying cause. That cause was the 1808 invasion of Napoleon to the Iberian Peninsula, where he deposed the Spanish king, Ferdinand VII, and imposed his brother as the new monarch. Given the hierarchical nature of Spanish society, whose legitimacy depended entirely on the king, his removal caused a serious questioning that spread like wildfire across the continent. This division was particularly evident between Peninsulares, the Spanish born in Spain, and the Criollos, Spanish born in the Americas. Starting in 1809, 
en Ecuador, en Bolivia, and then continuing in Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, and Chile, criollos declare their local government to be autonomous and set up juntas to rule in the name of the king. The crown representatives in the Americas, mostly peninsulares, were not so keen on this development and tried to crush the autonomous movements. The royalists succeeded in Ecuador, Bolivia, and Chile, but were less successful in Venezuela and Argentina. And so it would be from these two places that the liberating armies of South America would march out of. Led by Simón Bolívar in Venezuela and José de San Martín in Argentina, they would converge in Guayaquil, Ecuador in 1822, liberating countries as they went. Mexico and Central America would follow a slightly different path with an insurgency that began with the priest Miguel Hidalgo in 1810, followed by José María Morelos in 1811 and which would eventually culminate with the Declaration of Independence in 1821 of Agustín de Iturbide, a former soldier in the Royalist armies. Central America would also declare itself independent in 1821 and join Iturbide's empire. There would still be several battles, like that of Ayacucho in 1824 and the expulsion of the Spanish in Chiloé in Upper Peru, but by 1833 the Spanish had given up entirely their intention to reconquer Spanish America and maintained only Cuba and Puerto Rico as colonies. In the meantime, while Brazil at first might have seemed destined to avoid independence since the entire monarchy had to flee from Napoleon and ended up living in Rio, making Brazil equal in stature to the metropole, in the end it also became independent in 1822. That was because in 1821, King Joao VI was forced to return to Portugal or risk losing his crown, and his son, Don Pedro I declared Brazilian independence after Portugal attempted to restore Brazil to its colonial status, an intolerable situation for the prince. This made Brazilian independence far less violent than its Spanish counterparts and made it easier to keep the entire Portuguese empire as a single country, not so for Spanish America, which promptly broke apart. At first, the triumphant Spanish criollos tried to follow the lines of the old Spanish viceroyalties and Simón Bolívar famously spoke of a confederation that would contain all of Spanish America. But this plan failed amid massive geographical constraints and lack of political consensus. Thus, the Viceroyalty of La Plata became modern-day Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. The Viceroyalty of Peru became Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. The Viceroyalty of Granada, which even managed to hold a confederation from 1819 to 1831, eventually fragmented itself into Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela, and the Viceroyalty of New Spain saw first the separation of Central America into a single republic, and then this division in turn break up into modern-day Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. It is this key moment that explains why Latin America began to diverge economically from the United States and Canada. Look at this graph. You can see here that they begin in similar circumstances, but the 19th century was a lost one, and even though Latin America begins to grow again in the 20th century, it is already way behind by then. The reason for the deviation is that political disagreements led not only to a fragmentation that resulted in smaller, weaker countries, but also civil wars that created massive political instability that dominated the region for most of the 19th century. Ironically, the worst case ended up being Bolívar's main project, Colombia, which would see violence well into the 20th century. The main political areas of contention mapped out roughly into two opposing camps between liberals and conservatives. These were whether a country should be federal or unitary, the role that the Catholic Church should play, and how much power presidents should have. Generally speaking, liberals tended to prefer federal secular countries while conservatives favored unitary Catholic ones. Presidential power preferences, on the other hand, largely depended on who was in power at the time and differed vastly across time and space. During this period, the instability problem was usually only solved through the appearance of caudillos, charismatic strongmen that dominated countries through personal loyalty rather than institutions. Classic examples include Juan Manuel de Rosas in Argentina, Antonio López de Santa Ana in Mexico, Gaspar Rodríguez de Francia in Paraguay, and José Antonio Páez in Venezuela. The exceptions to this general pattern, Chile and Costa Rica, would be not coincidentally the countries that would end up as the richer and more stable democracies in the region. 
Meanwhile, Brazil, despite enjoying stability for the better part of the 19th century, had its own vision of caudillos. These were called coronage, local power brokers that would end up being central to the clientelistic system that would develop after the end of the monarchy in 1889. Meanwhile, much of this political conflict was carried out amongst the elite, although indigenous and Afro-descendants did fight and die in the various wars and occasionally were caudillos themselves, as in the case of Rafael Carrera in Guatemala or Porfirio Diaz in Mexico. These were nat mass conflicts that attempted to mobilize large swaths of the population, and as such were not much preoccupied with providing public goods or improving the inequality that had dominated the region since the colonial era. Thus, although by the end of the 19th century, for the most part, liberals dominated the entire region and ruled either through dictators, as in the case of Guatemala, Mexico, and Venezuela, or most commonly, oligarchies, as in the case of Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, or Peru, efforts to integrate the masses were limited and for the most part depended almost entirely on export-led growth, often in labor-intensive industries that benefited mostly the elite, such as mining in Bolivia and Chile, cattle in Argentina and Uruguay, and coffee and bananas in Central America. The pent-up demands could not be ignored, however. The pent-up demands could not be ignored forever, however, and the 20th century saw these come into the fore in various guises. There were revolutions and attempted revolutions, such as the Mexican Revolution of 1910, a bottom-up social explosion that directly shaped Mexican politics for the following 80 years or the failed radical Argentine Revolution of 1905, which although unsuccessful, paved the way for secret and universal male suffrage under the Sign Spania Law of 1912. There was also massive general strikes and labor organization that accelerated after the Great Depression. How these demands were incorporated into the various countries' politics, whether they were integrated through laws or different types of political parties, would shape not just the future of labor movements, but the future type of political regime. Of course, in many places these were brutally repressed, as was the case in 1932 in El Salvador, where an indigenous uprising demanding better wages and working conditions was crushed by the Salvadoran army. The event known as La Matanza resulted in the killing of between 10 and 40,000 people. Other instances include Guayaquil in 1922, where a general strike ended in the massacre of at least 300 people. Also, the Banana Massacre of 1928 in Colombia, where the government killed hundreds and maybe even thousands of banana plantation workers who were striking for better conditions, among many, many other examples across the continent. Still, the Great Depression crisis and the subsequent recovery during the 1940s and 1950s saw many countries in Latin America become democracies. These were flawed and had all sorts of problems, but did have free and fair elections and at least some modicum of free expression, like Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Uruguay. Others were corporatist hybrid regimes, like Mexico under the PRI and Argentina under Perón, but were still responsive to labor's demands. Latin America might have gone along like this in a path of deeper democratization, bringing along the countries that were still dictatorships during this period, like the Dominican Republic under Trujillo, Nicaragua under the Somozas, or Peru with its military always lurking in the background. But after 1948, there was one major variable that changed this dynamic entirely. That was the Cold War rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States. During this period, the number one foreign policy for the U.S. that superseded all others was stopping the spread of communism. Unfortunately for Latin America, this meant that most efforts to try to deal with inequality or provide public social goods became immediately suspect in American eyes. And thus, from the mid-1950s to the 1980s, the U.S. actively intervened in Latin America. It acted directly to overturn democracies such as in Guatemala in 1954, Chile in 1976, supported military regimes that toppled democracies in the name of stopping communism such as in Brazil in 1964, Bolivia under Banset in 1971, or Argentina during the Dirty War. The U.S. also renewed its commitment to dictatorships in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Paraguay, and so on. The one place where it failed, the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961 in Cuba, became an inspiration for anti-imperialists everywhere. Thus, for most of this period, there were only a handful of democracies that survived, Colombia and Venezuela through a power-sharing agreement where parties agreed to include in government those who lost, 
and Costa Rica, which remained the exception to the rule in Central America. Those who opposed or were perceived to be a threat to the various dictatorships could expect repression, torture, and death. The same could be said for anyone non-political who might help the first group or who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But for the rest of the population, this period was not as awful as it might seem because Latin America grew economically and thus the standard of living for the average person improved basically everywhere except for those places where civil wars reigned, such as in Central America. A big reason for the growth was a strategy called import substitution industrialization, a process whereby governments created local industry by imposing tariffs on imports. This, coupled with a developmentalism that aimed to build massive infrastructure projects, created jobs and gave legitimacy to dictatorships. Modernity had come to Latin America, and for many, that was enough. Unfortunately, this model was completely unsustainable. In effect, this model is a tax that people pay for the privilege of buying goods made in their own country. And as long as people keep buying and the state keeps reinvesting to make the industry more efficient, it can work. But once the markets are saturated, the government must spend more and more to prop up the local industry. Several countries did just that, Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil in particular. But once the oil crisis hit and Latin America could neither borrow more to keep the model going nor pay its debt as tax revenues collapsed, the region went into massive economic turmoil, the debt crisis they called it, and it was brutal. It came with collapsing businesses, bank failures, and hyperinflation. As bad as it was, it also meant that the one pillar of support that dictatorships had evaporated. Although the particulars differed, in Argentina, for instance, it was the economy plus the humiliating defeat at the hands of the British when the military tried to regain the Falkland Islands that did it. One by one, democracies began to return across the region. By 1997, the only non-democracy that remained in the continent was Cuba. It helped that the Cold War ended and stopping communism was no longer the only American foreign policy goal. So the U.S. stopped funding the Contras in Nicaragua and supporting the right-wing dictatorships in the region. With democracy also came neoliberalism, an economic model that embraced privatization and free trade and got rid of protectionist regulations. At its height, in the late 1990s, Latin America was enthusiastically joining free trade blocs, NAFTA for Mexico, Mercosur for South America. The problem was that while neoliberalism did eventually get the economy growing again and the debt crisis was overcome, it came at a huge cost. Privatization meant massive sudden unemployment, free trade meant choices for consumers but also tons of companies that could not compete and would go under, and the lack of subsidies meant that a huge part of the cost for economic growth was paid by the poorest of the poor. This, coupled with disillusionment with democracy in general, produced an immediate reaction like the riots of the 1989 Caracaso in Venezuela. In other places, social upheaval would take longer as decisions that looked reasonable at first, like the pegging of the Argentine peso to the dollar championed by Carlos Menem, ended up causing huge problems when the country was forced to the value in 2001 and millions lost their savings in the so-called Corralito scandal. Neoliberalism ended up producing a lot of detractors, and the continent moved left in what observers called the pink wave, somewhere of a more radical bent, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia, or Rafael Correa in Ecuador. Some seemed like they would be quite radical, but were not, once in office, like Guillain Tomala in Peru, and some were more moderate, like Lula in Brazil, the Kirchners in Argentina, and the Frente Amplio in Uruguay. There was also one case where voters elected someone to keep the pink wave at bay, Álvaro Uribe in Colombia. These leftist regimes, particularly Correa and Chávez, were able to remain popular because of the commodity boom in the 2010s, the global demand for Latin American products, especially from China. Once demand started to go down, however, so did the support for the pink wave. As of May 2021, only Maduro in Venezuela and Ortega in Nicaragua remain in charge, both having used anti-democratic means to remain in power. Today, Latin Americans' problems are many. The two worst issues are security and inequality. Crime in recent years has exploded, especially in Venezuela, Mexico, and the surrounding Central American countries. Inequality, meanwhile, remains, as the social pyramid inherited from colonial times has not changed much. Latin America does a pretty terrible job of educating its citizens, which in turn means that it cannot produce enough good jobs for people to pull themselves out of poverty. 
nor does it generate enough revenue to do more about the problem. COVID has exacerbated both of these problems. Democracies in the region limp along, but as Latin America tries to regain its economic footing, there's concern that some of them might turn authoritarian, especially Peru and El Salvador. The single bright spot is Chile, as it gets ready to write a new constitution. Whether it can be a model for the rest of the continent remains to be seen.